no longer silent patient access stories. Systems have kept Black people from making the necessary moves for better life, period. That's why I got into this work. We are getting loud today with Regina Smith. This sister right here, she is a natural born nurturer. She loves to love on you. And if you ever need an extra dose of love, Regina is your girl. She is a geriatric social worker and a doctor of social work candidate. You know, when you look at us, Um, Regina and Tammy having this conversation. We are truly, you know, walking, talking, living, breathing, moving miracles because our upbringing would have dictated that our lives would look drastically different than what they do. And I come into this space having lost my mom at an early age. And even though you are just a few years older than me, you have been that constant in my life that I have looked for, for stability, for guidance, um, for support, for love. And it is an honor to be in this space, doing this work, having this conversation with you on this day. Well, that brings up a whole lot of emotions in this moment for me, Tammy, because my brother called me this morning with almost those exact words. Wow. And I don't know why he felt he needed to say those words to me. And I don't know why you feel you needed to say that, because for me, I just know how to be Regina. I didn't choose to be all of those things to you or to Darren or to whoever. I, the roles that I've played, it's just me. It's a part of my personality. Mm-hmm. I've tried to reinvent that personality because at one point in time, I think somebody described me as being mampy pampy or weak. And I think this is, this just kind of spills over into who I am as a social worker. But when I look back and think about those roles of being, of showing the love and being the support and just always being there, I think that's just, it's not because it's been drilled in my head. It's just because that's just who I am. It's just who I am. I don't know to not show up and be that support, be that love, be that uh, connector, be that bridge builder, be that gap filler, be that compassion. I don't know how to not be those things. And so hearing you say that, um, it gives me joy to hear that I was that for you. But it also gives me um, sadness to know that you had that loss so early. Yeah, you know, it gives it gives me um It gives me sadness also. And at the same time, we grew up, you know, like many black folks did in the church, going to church. And so we were taught about God from a very early age. I don't know if we knew then. Well, we couldn't have known then as children what we know now about who God is. But as I started to navigate high school and college, you know, when I came home from from college, I came to your house mm-hmm. and your place was my refuge. Mm-hmm. Your place was really starting to build those core memories uh, or, or I should say replace core memories for me mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because my original core memories had been filled with trauma. Mm-hmm. And so here you are laying a foundation that when you say, you know, the people that will hear this podcast, they don't know you. They're right. only getting to know you. And so they may say, oh, many people say that. All black women say that this is just me. But I am a living witness that it is all in and through who you are as a human being. So, you know, just dialing it back a little bit about as a child, not really knowing who God is or growing up in the church and we not really having this strong foundation in Christ because we are young. We 
don't really know who God is. You know, you grow up and you start, you're maturing. For me as a child, I can remember specifically twice as a child, once at age 10, having a dream about this grim reaper. This is the only way I can describe this spirit or this entity. Um, It was like a grim reaper that stood over our home, over our neighborhood, really, but particularly over our home. And I remember this entity um, defecating on top of our house, and then it would go over other people's homes. Little, Little did I know at 10 years old that this was a spirit of death, but I knew it was some type of destructive demonic spirit, right? And I woke up and I remember saying, God, protect us. And I didn't know what I was asking God to protect us from. That was just my prayer. God, protect us. I later learned that our home and the other homes that I saw this particular spirit defecating on top of each of those homes, those parents or fathers in those homes were into drugs, which my father was, of course, you know, was into drugs. And so a year after that, I had another dream. Oh, it wasn't a dream. It was a real incident where we were held at gunpoint. It wasn't even quite a year. Some months later, we were held at gunpoint in our basement. And I can remember praying, God, if you save us, I'll serve you. And I said, when I, if you save us, when I turn 18, I'll serve you. And I remember the timeline. And again, I'm 11 years old. I'm making this promise to God. And so going back to us not really having a real cognizant or real in-depth relationship with God as a kid, I would say that was really the beginning of my relationship, a real relationship with God, because I was aware that I made that promise to God. When I was in college, one month before my 19th birthday, God reminded me of that very night, the whole scene came back to me. And I remember jumping up, running through the uh, town. I was at Vincennes University, running through Vincennes, Indiana, banging on church doors. This is in 1980, 81. I'm banging on church doors, looking for somebody to open up and to lead me to Christ because I had made this promise. And there was a a Methodist pastor that opened the door. Uh, It was a white Methodist pastor, opened the door and asked me, what was I doing out at 10 o'clock at night, banging on the door? And I shared my story with him. And he just held my hand and led me in a sinner's prayer. And from that moment on, it was that moment sealed the deal. But that moment was not the defining moment of my salvation. It just sealed the deal that I had made with God at 11. And I think that has been the guiding point of how and why I have loved the way I have loved. Mm, that's, mm, that's rich. Ooh, that's, I'm just, I'm just chewing on that for a second and letting it settle in. But, you know, as I am just furiously taking notes on what you're sharing. Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, you know, some of the parts of this story I'm familiar with and Mm -hmm. others I'm not. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, my, my comment about us in relationship Mm -hmm. is that not to say, not to take what God does in some, Mm -hmm. Um, at early ages, that's scripture, that's biblical, that's even Jesus, right? right? Absolutely. So um, not to take away that at at all. Um, Most children Mm -hmm. are not that in tune and aware and care enough about God to to even have those type of dreams, hold on to them, seek Mm -hmm. understanding with them, apply them to our lives and, mm-hmm. you know, have additional experiences. Because you got to think about this is 60 years later and I'm still recalling. Absolutely. Every detail. Well, not that's 60 years, 50 calling. years later. I'm still recalling every detail of this. And that is exactly where I'm headed with what, what, what I'm headed with. And you, you kind of ended with, you know, and I think that's the way, I, that's why I love the way that I love. Mm-hmm. Um, and is that not God's love? Is that yes. not unconditional love? Yes. Is that not, you know, what this whole God thing and this whole love thing is all about anyway? 
in me, he put this ability that's greater than me. It's not something that I desire. There's so many times I would like, I don't, I don't want to take care of another person. I don't want to love this way anymore. This kind of, this manner of love hurts. I'm tired, Lord. Even now, as I'm finishing this dissertation, I don't want another person to need me. I want to stick a pen in the, I need Regina (laughs) bubble. Right, right, right. (laughs) My hope is that when you complete this dissertation and, you know, you've been given the world's uh, credentials, even though you already have God's credential (laughs) of Dr. Regina uh, K. Smith, you will take some time to rest and Uh rejuvenate because your work and your calling is too great and too important for you to be burnt out and stressed out so soon in mm-hmm. in your um, in, in what God is really doing. The rest of it, God has always been doing it. It's been yes. preparation. Now it's go time. Yes, yes. It is, it is, it is, it is, now it's go time. And, and that's what I feel. I do feel the go time. I don't feel, I'm not burnt out to the point of quitting. I'm burnt out into the to the point of getting to the next. I'm ready to put boots back on the ground and get back out there because my greatest genius is doing what I do. Right. It is not in the prep. I, I, I like crisis management. I don't like preparing the box for crisis management. <laughs> right. Somebody right. else can do that. <laughs> right. You know, and, and, um, and it is also Preparation is also important. You know, with every step of humanity, there was preparation. Absolutely. You know, regardless of what it looked like, whether it was formal education or even boots on the ground on the job training. Absolutely. Um, preparation. <laughs> if I go back to where we started this conversation, our childhoods mm-hmm. have been preparation for us to be where we are today. Yes. It's no happenstance that we both had life changing traumatic experiences at age 11 mm-hmm. that made us know wow our, right that wow. made us know i just realized that that's right <laughs> age 11 i was i was 11 wow um, yeah so that takes me a little bit into you know, our conversation today. The conversation is no longer silent. Mm-hmm. And we're telling stories about patient access mm-hmm. um, issues and challenges. How do you feel your life prepared you to be so good at crisis management? Do you think it was intentional or do you think it's, it's a byproduct as, as a result of your life? I think it's both. Okay. I think it's both. A byproduct of my life, survival. You know, I had to learn to survive. Growing up in a house of addiction, you learn to survive. And intentional, I determined I was never going to be like that environment that I grew up in. So um, I did the necessary things to position myself to live a different lifestyle to be a better person, to be a different person. I won't say that I'm better than my family, but to 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 make different and better choices than my family did, my mom and dad did. Systemically, I could have definitely made some choices or been caught in a system of oppression. I think the fact that I'm just now getting these degrees and just now, fin- because i this is late. I'm very not necessarily late for this doctoral degree, but just late for going back to school because this has really just been a 10 year run of the entire education. Systemically, when I first started school, they did nothing to prepare me for school. I was not prepared for some of the challenges um, that I encountered. So when I look at what made me decide to go into the field that I'm in was to really, even though it's geriatric, I really, I really want to change the way systems, systems as a whole. I mean, I could change gears in a heartbeat because systems have kept black people from making the necessary moves for better life, period. That's why I got into this work. Wow. Yeah. So, so Rich, um, you, I'm going to start a little bit 
where you were ending when you said that you you kind of started your career late in life. Um, there's a concept called weathering, and it's looking at Black women um, and our experiences and how we uh, continually have to survive mm-hmm. and have to. Um, continually rebuild ourselves Uh to be resilient. And uh, I am suggesting that based on, you know, this type of thinking with this, this weathering concept that black women don't have a choice. Many of us, I I would love to see some statistics around how many black women got their education and or higher education degrees later in life, because at the beginning of our lives, we're in survival. Mm-hmm. You and I both went to college, not because we wanted to a higher education. I don't even think we knew what that meant. We went we for were survival. Escaping <laughs> toxic environments, and there was something inside us. God put something inside of us to tell us that there is more to life than this. What's happening right here yes. on this block? and in this house, and in your life. Right. Yes. Yes. God gave us those visions um, at, at young ages. Yes. When I think about the first time I went to school at 18, I went to three different colleges in one semester. <laughs> Jesus be <laughs> offense. <laughs> Well, because I was doing what other people were doing. So when I started talking about systemic racism and and how the system failed me, no one was fighting me. I was just doing things. And as long as I had, uh, I was a part of groups and I was able, I could, uh, I was eligible for the financial backing. The school took me. They mm-hmm. didn't care that my grades didn't meet mm-hmm. the requirement. They only cared that this money followed the problem. Right. Mm-hmm. And I was a problem. And they, the schools benefited from the in fact. First of all, no one ever addressed my learning disability. That was never addressed, not even in school. And so I just went. And so the fact that I could go from IU to IUPUI to Vincennes all in one semester and no one ever set me down and said, hey, you got to at least wait till the semester's over to transfer schools. You need to flunk out first or transfer. You know, that's not how the system works for me. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and speaking of that systemic um, oppression, and how no one followed you, no one cared about you, and they were just following the money, and they had labeled you as being a problem. Mm-hmm. Which I didn't know. You know, you don't no, know I, that. Correct. Don't know that. That's, that's the system. You know, I mean, if <laughs> this that that's a whole nother podcast, but I mean, we're in a whole system right now that is on target to oppress further oppress black people, even in 2024. Yeah. You get these acceptance letters. These kids get these. And you really think that you have, yeah, I got in, I got in. And they're so excited. And you get this acceptance letter and you really think that you have arrived somewhere and you did, you just arrived to another system to continue to oppress you. Girl, you better say that again for the people. (laughs) They ain't heard you say it again. You did. You got accepted into another system that will continue to oppress you because they have not taken into accountability who you are, where you come from, your environment, anything. They don't know anything about you as a black individual. <laughs> oh, man, I'm going to throw these notes in the trash and we're going to have to go in a hole because <laughs> you are preaching a whole sermon right now. Let's shift the conversation then and move into... Um, The reason you actually said yes to this interview. Tell us your story where you or a loved one experience access to equitable, timely, quality health care was a problem. So for me, my story starts with my mom allowing her to first try to navigate her own health care and recognizing that the more she advocated or Manage, tried to manage her own health care, um, her health was worsening. Um, she was, my, because of her history of 
substance abuse and mental uh, health challenges at an early age. It um, affected her in her older age. Um, because once you are labeled an addict, it stays with you all of your life, no matter when when the abuse, the substance abuse stops. If the, if it reaches the hospital level, that label stays with you. And so um, my mom had, you know, had an addiction problem. And so although her addiction problem was over years, you know, she still was labeled. And so anytime there was pain, anytime there was... Uh, mental issues, anytime there was a headache, anything, she was never given proper care. Mm -hmm. um, being black, being female, uh, being having mental illness. And so um, when she when it got to the point where she was bowed over, they wanted to do surgery and said they weren't able to do surgery on her. They had given her a whole bunch of runaround, and it wasn't making sense the way she was explaining to me. So then I stepped in and wanted to know what the deal was. So I started going to the uh, doctor's appointments with her, and just the way they talked to her in the waiting room, it started with that, how she was called back. You know, um, the way they pronounced her name, Miss Dodson, it was just horrible. It wasn't with any respect, they just handled her very roughly. And so I set back the first visit or two. And then I was like, no, we're going to, we're going to clean some of this language up. You know, we're going, we're going to first clean up how you are addressing her and how you are handling her. You know, you know, my mother never showed up nowhere unless she was dressed to the nine. <laughs> so there was no, she didn't go anywhere looking like she was homeless. And so there was no reason to, handle her. But then even if she was homeless, there was no reason to mishandle her. So mm -hmm. that was, that was part of the first uh, reasons. And then um, I noticed that home health care agencies, the companies that they were sending, the um, home health aides that they were sending was taking advantage. They was, when she did get medicine, it was being stolen. So there was no accountability for okay. uh, medicine. So I it just, just, just mistreatment of care. Um, so I just stepped in and I said, well, let me see. And so when I stepped in, she was going to several different doctors. There was no continuity of care. There was um, no communication or collaboration. Uh, there was no explanation to her. She didn't know why she was on half the medication she was on. Plus, she was also uh, had dementia and no one diagnosed the dementia. No one addressed the dementia. They just thought she was, they just kept dumping medicine, dumping medicine. That in and of itself made me say, well, wait a minute. And so once I started seeing it in her, I started recognizing these systems affecting other people the same way, other Blacks the same way. We want to pause for a moment to thank our platinum partner, Amgen. Amgen has been a consistent partner who not just talks the talk, they fight hard to illuminate voices and experiences of diverse patients. We're truly thankful for such a beautiful partner. This conversation is also activated by Genentech and Change for Sean. Thank you to all of our partners. So what did you, what or did you do anything? Oh, absolutely. I became her healthcare rep and then I became her power of attorney um, so that I could uh, manage her health care, all of her health care decisions. Uh, my mom was making all kinds of misjudgment calls with her bills, uh, with her, so her finances was all over the place. Um, her medications were all over the place. Her food, she stopped eating. She started just eating um, canned foods, just all these different types of things was happening when she'd have a refrigerator full of food. Um, so yes, then I started going over weekly and then the week weekly visits weren't enough. Then they had to start going a couple times a week. And so then I had to start um, just coordinating her care um, better, just start managing, coordinating her care more closely than I had been. Again, all of this was over time. I thought she was capable of doing it. I thought there was UTIs. I thought these were just little things that was adding up before I recognized the dementia. And then once I recognized the dementia and I brought it to her doctor's attention, they weren't so sure it was dementia. They were more so 
saying it was part of her mental illness. So that part um, really kind of honked me off because it did. <laughs> because um, that's another um, that's another form of oppression. Mm-hmm. Because when you have people who have mental illnesses, my mom was a schizophrenic. Mm-hmm. Um, but she was controlled. It was managed. No, a lot of people didn't even know she had schizophrenia. Um, was, was, was she diagnosed schizophrenia? Yeah, she was diagnosed schizophrenia when she was very young. She was diagnosed schizophrenia in 1970. So she lived with schizophrenia for a very long time. So that's what I'm saying. That was such an old diagnosis. And yet you're they're hanging everything off, everything on that diagnosis. And mental health organizations closed down. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of facilities closed down. So she was no longer seeing a psychiatrist. She was no longer getting the mental health care that she should have been getting, that she used to get in the 70s and 80s. Mm. Because by the 90s, all of those facilities were closed. Was this a national closure or is this... Mm -hmm. So mm-hmm. this happened nationwide? This happened nationwide, yeah. That's why you ended up started seeing a lot of homelessness and people with mental issues on the streets. And in Indiana, they closed down all of the mental institutes. She was never in a mental institution, but she was seeing uh, a psychiatrist. She was seeing counseling. And so that all went away. And she was managed by, um, she started being managed by the hospital who then sent her to primary care. And then they just, these new types of meds came out, um, which never really worked for her. You know, the new pharmaceuticals that came out um, never really supported her. I think the mismanagement of the mental health disorder is what re-triggered the substance abuse disorder. Mm. So I, I, let me connect the dot really quickly. Mm-hmm. When you were in high school, mm-hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna gather in high school, moving mm-hmm. into college, and um, the system failed you mm-hmm. because no one was caring about you. They mm-hmm. cared about the check that came along with you. Mm-hmm. So then you fast forward 20, 30, 40 years, mm-hmm. we have another system that is failing your mother. Mm-hmm. Same mm-hmm. system. Same system. Failing your mother, mm-hmm. but care only care about her check mm-hmm. and not her as a human being. Mm-hmm. Because you said something, you said when you recognized mm-hmm. the dementia, mm-hmm. you. Yeah. And that's why I went back to ask, when was she diagnosed with schizophrenia? So she was diagnosed she with was di- mm-hmm. in 1970. Mm-hmm. So you recognize dementia when? So the dementia, she did not get a, di- a dementia diagnosis until I took over her care. And that was probably, I would say seven years, seven years. I would say seven years. Okay. Yeah. But but the point is, the point is that whether it's 2014 or 2017, none of that really matters. Mm -hmm. What matters is that you had to bring to the attention of her her healthcare providers. Um, Well, I'll do you even better, not to cut you off. I'm caregiver for my father, right? Mm -hmm. And I know that my dad has dementia. They call it cognitive decline because he continues to pass the MOCA score, the MOCA test for Mm -hmm. the MOCA is a cognitive test for people Mm -hmm. with dementia. Mm -hmm. He passes it every time. They did three of them in one week. Well, it's about numbers. Mm -hmm. This man is a numbers man for the black folks out there in the room. No, he shakes and pool tabs and things like that. He's a number man. He's always going to pass it. Yeah. Yeah. But if you ask him what he ate this morning, he cannot tell you. you. If he got dressed and his underwear were red and you asked him if he put on red underwear, he will not know without looking, even though he dressed himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you asked him what color shoes he has on without looking down, he has to look down to tell you. Yeah. But those are not the questions. No. So to me, the assessments for dementia are not always 
the right assessments, Mm -hmm. especially for people of color. They're not culturally responsive. That's it. Exactly what I was going to ask you. They're not. So, you know, the purpose of this podcast and the purpose of this conversation is for us to raise awareness, provide some education, but also to challenge legislators and policymakers about the policies that continue to perpetuate a system Mm -hmm. um, that has failed you and your family your entire life. Mm -hmm. What do we do about it? You know, if I was a policymaker, what would you say to me? Um, For me right now, uh, back to the question of intentionality, Mm -hmm. like you, like Carrie's touch, I am intentionally setting my voice myself Mm -hmm. in places where I can poke the bear, so to speak, Mm -hmm. poke legislation, legislators, powers that be, that this is a problem. I continue to um, speak to the challenges, the barriers, the gaps Mm -hmm. in healthcare for people of color. And I say people of color in this point, even though we're talking about black, because I do, I'm a social worker, you know, and I, my care, when I think about uh, Hispanic populations, there's, you know, I, I had a patient that was solely believed that his wife's Alzheimer's and dementia was his his fault because he had stepped out one time on his wife and he felt like he brought a curse, but that was his custom and that was his belief. And that had to do with his religion. And he wanted a shaman and we couldn't, we couldn't bring a shaman, but we also didn't address his spiritual need. Mm -hmm. He did not even acknowledge his spiritual need. And the fact that his wife was dying, we didn't offer him prayer, a priest, anyone to meet that spiritual need. And so that's important. That type of care is important even to the dying. So, yeah, we we have to keep positioning ourselves to make noise. So uh, I try to get on every board I can. (laughs) I make sure that I am um, looking at policies um, that's going to affect me, myself as I age, because that's affecting my dad now. That's affecting other people, um, even in the field that I work in. I educate, 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 educate. Wow. Yeah. And just, um, you know, just to speak to the phrase people of color, well, let's just be clear. Cancer doesn't discriminate and neither do we. No. Start there. But secondly, and, you know, when you listen to some of the other stories, um, you will see that we don't just have black women on 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 because that's not the fabric of America. Right. You know, Mm -hmm. uh, America is a melting pot and we Mm -hmm. have a little bit of everybody here. And while we didn't we couldn't get everybody, you know, to be part of this conversation, I wish we could, because Mm -hmm. then we could have the needle to move forward um, a little bit. You know, and I, I hear what you're saying about this man, that this man needed someone to care about him and his need. Not right. the perceived need mm-hmm. for him, was, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because oftentimes that perceived need doesn't match or align with us culturally, right? Um, and culturally, um, Hispanic people, uh, Latino people, y- y- you know, and Black people, we are very spiritual people, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and our spirituality definitely comes comes first for for many of us. So to ignore that means that they ignored his humanity. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and really for Hispanic and Latina, Latino as well as black, our spirituality even comes before a diagnosis. We don't care what a diagnosis is. We don't we're going to talk to Jesus about this thing first, and then we're going to talk to the doctor. <laughs> right. That's after we have heard clearly from God that we are supposed to take this journey. And then that's, we it. The As, that's right. That's my cancer. That's my cancer. <laughs> oh, don't put that label off on me. That's, that's right. right. I'm I not that in you. Name Jesus, I am healed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Keep it moving, right? You that's right. That's, roll, run it all the way down. Absolutely. Right? So that right? I mean, you know, that's 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 definitely where we at. <laughs> right, right. So Regina, yeah. here's a question. The system has failed you and your loved ones your entire life, and yet you are pursuing a PhD in social work. Yeah. 
system. Uh, say it again. <laughs> what a system. In a, in, inside of a system. Mm-hmm. It, that it, am, am I uh, misaligned by saying that there has to be some hope? Within you? It, it, no, you're not misaligned. And there is some hope within me. And I don't think throwing the dart from the outside inward is going to make the change. But I think being on the inside, maneuvering things around will make the change. Being the, you know, it's like, you know, you have an itch on the inside that you can't scratch. That's what I hope to be. The itch on the inside. Mm-hmm. The itch on the inside. Somebody's got to be there. So, and are you at liberty to say, you know, what that looks like? What uh, the change looks so, like? So, yeah, well, I, right now I am sitting in a seat that I truly do not want to continue to sit in anymore. So my next steps is, like I said, education is huge for me. So continue to, to mark education. Um, also, I'm, I'm a geriatric social worker at this point in my life. I love geriatrics, but again, uh, I can shift gears because systems are really where um, I see the problem. And so um, my end result and end goal is to to be to work in legislation. I I really want to work in policy. So are you saying that you're going to be a politician? I could be. I'm not saying it, but I'm not. I'm also not going to rule it out. I'm not saying it, but I'm not going to rule it out. Let's go. Let's make it happen. I absolutely love this. As we're winding down, I do want to circle back to one thing and there is because there's some information that I have that I think is crucial based on what you just said about you um, have having this affinity toward education. Mm-hmm. Um, and a system failed you mm-hmm. in education. And there was a pivotal moment in your journey. Mm-hmm that shifted you from your view of yourself mm-hmm. with regard to education. Are, are, do, how comfortable do you feel sharing that with us? Oh, I'm comfortable. I can share. Okay. So I, I think I alluded to the fact of this learning disability. And so um, I, I've always really wanted to go back to school and get these degrees or I fin- did I finished high school, but I, I kept my high school uh, transcripts knowing that it had all Fs. Lord, again, system fail. How in the world did they let me graduate? It's beyond me. But anyway, um, I've always wanted, I've always known in the back of my mind and heart that there was intelligence. But how I was going to get it out, I did not know. And so... Um, my, I homeschooled my kids, and as I was homeschooling my children, I said, "You know what? You're going to learn. You're going. You. This is going to be your time to figure out the broken places and learn." And so I did. I just I took myself back to school when I took my kids back to school, mm-hmm. and um, I mean, I had some foundational um, things. I mean, I knew one plus one was two. <laughs> But I didn't know three times five was 15 and five times three was 15. It Mm. took a while to figure that out. But once I did, there was just something down in me, a gnawing on the inside of me that wanted more. Um, And so when the light bulb came on after my kids graduated college, then I said, it's my turn. And so um, I think it was the during the year that Obama ran for president in the first year that he ran on yes we can mm-hmm. I said yes I can and yeah. and I laid in my bed and on a whim I said let me see how much money I owe uh Ivy Tech <laughs> and it was three hundred dollars wow and I had been afraid to even address the issue of going back to school for years because I knew that I had a bill somewhere at some school that was going to catch up with me. Mm-hmm. And it was all $300. And I couldn't believe that for all those years I had been sitting in fear of bettering myself. And so I did. I answered it. I 
fill the application out. And just like all these other students, I got accepted mm-hmm. to systems of oppression. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Gosh, what are we doing this? Um, but um, I'm choosing to do something different. Yeah. I'm challenging these systems of oppression. Mm-hmm. I'm challenging them to do better by me, to give yeah. me the education that my money is paying for. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, so, so much good stuff. Um, I, and I, oh, okay. So much good stuff. And I don't want it to get lost on people that, a school challenge that you had was knowing that three times five is 15 and also five times three is 15. Uh That's a whole nother conversation in Uh itself, just dealing with what was happening with you cognitively. Uh You weren't able to make that connection that these are the exact same numbers in this equation, just in different positions. And I bring that up because how many of our children across this nation are struggling in homes of trauma with the same equation, (laughs) so to speak. And with the same equation, right? Mm -hmm. And so I love what you being so transparent and illuminating some of the struggles that you've overcome, you know, with, with tagging on to President Obama and his 2008 yes i can campaign mm-hmm. yes we can and yes we can personalizing it uh-huh. and calling it the yes i can um but i i i want to i want to this will be my last question well my last okay. formal question but i want to just shift to say you know I, it feels like dorothy from the wizard of oz mm-hmm. when she meets glinda the good witch and she's got on her beautiful ruby red slippers and she tells her to click her heels three times and she informs her or illuminates for her mm-hmm. that you've had the power within you mm. this whole time regina i want to say to you mm. that as you are on this final stretch toward completing your dissertation and this is when it really gets tough because you're tired, you're over it, and you just want to be done. And I call you Dr. Smith now and you say, well, no, I've got to wait. I say to you, <laughs> you've had it in you this whole time. Everything that you've needed, every obstacle that you've overcome, every fear that tried to deter you from moving forward, you have chosen from within mm-hmm. that 316, that John 316 mm-hmm. type of love that you learned about as a nine year old, then as an 11 year old, what then became real mm-hmm. it's been in you this entire time. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, for me, you continue to be a guiding light and a beacon of hope. But people don't know you the way I know you. So could you just leave us with a few words in response to what I just said about, you know, greatness already being within you? Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for those words. I. That's hard to leave some words behind that because another part of my uh, positionality is I don't like the light shining on me at all. <laughs> That's a hard thing to do. But um, you're right. It is already in me. Um, Greater is he that is within me than he that is in this world, you know. And I think knowing that because Christ abides in me, that gives me the strength to do the things that he has called me to do, allowed me to do. Um, I'm so thankful for, um, for that love. But I'm so determined to vindicate others. And that, I, I, that's part of the passion is vindicating, making right. And I, I think that's so Christ-like. You know, when I think about him hanging on the cross and the thief was on one side and I don't know what the other fellow did on the other side, but <laughs> they both were criminals, you know. But God made vindication And that's how I feel. I feel like that's the call that God has called me to. 
Um, I don't need a pulpit. Um, I know a lot of scriptures. I've, I've been walking and talking the word for a very long time, but I don't need to um, razzle dazzle. I don't need to in, to um, impress anyone with with a lot of word. I I like to live my life, not show off my life. And I like you to see the fruit that I bear when you walk up on me. That that's that's what I want to leave. When you have been in my presence, I want you to know that you've been with God. I mean, mic drop. <laughs> Just. <laughs> When you've been in my presence, I want you to know that you've been with God. Wow. I thank you for trusting me. I thank you for saying yes. You didn't have to say yes. We have a lot of family members who are not (laughs) in this discussion. So you didn't have to say yes, but I I definitely thank you for saying yes. Um, it was my pleasure. My uh, you know, I, I got a ton of notes. <laughs> oh, I, Lord. I got a, I got a ton of notes. I, I, if I separate them all of them, I think I have 14 notes. Oh, Lord. Um, just with nuggets that you dropped into my spirit. Um, and so we like to shift the conversation. I have a few more questions, but they are really top of mind, not deep thinking. If you think about it, that's the wrong answer. Um, It really is asking you, what is your preference? Day or night? Day. Chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. Breakfast or dinner? Dinner. What's your favorite genre of music? None. I I like music, all music. Okay. Even country. (laughs) Okay. Hey, well, we we actually originated country, but that's a whole nother conversation. Mm-hmm. Also. <laughs> and finally, Regina, what brings you joy? Loving, mm. just being, just loving on people. That brings me joy. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. <laughs> what can I say to you? Whew, you just take my breath away in the way you share the story, but in the nuggets of wisdom that you give to so many. And for our seniors, our beloved community that needs an advocate like you to speak on their behalf. Thank you for just truly being a born caregiver. Thank you to renowned virtual photographer, John Keatley and his incredible team. A special thanks to photos by A-Love LLC, April Jones, Retouch Artist, and to the dedicated Carrie's Touch tribe for your unwavering support in helping us create stories that heal. And another big thank you to our platinum sponsor, Amgen. For more information about these stories and other survivor support and advocacy information, visit us at our website at www.carriestouch.org.